CEO of Learning Council News Media and Research. We're going to get our research briefing right after Addison Doc. So welcome, Addison Davis. Thank you, ma'am. Hillsborough. He's going to give us his words of wisdom. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Thank you so very much. Raise your hand if you're not from Tampa region. Awesome. Well, welcome to a beautiful place, not only to, to live, to raise a family, but also to be an educator and also to receive an education. This is a, a vibrant place that has so much to be able to offer the community. I hope that you get a chance to, to interact with it over the next few days. But more importantly, you're here to be able to, to talk about how we improve then revolutionize our industry every single day. So I, I guess I'll popcorn this. You know, what do you hope to get out of today? And you can just popcorn and push it out. Ken says the future of the market. Future of the market. What else? I know it's early. I'm going to push you. Yes, sir. New ideas and new connections to other professionals. Yeah, that's perfect. What else? Uh, yes, sir. Trends and where things are going. Trends, okay. Rethink models of learning. Rethink models of learning. Absolutely. We've had to do that in the last couple of years tremendously and revolutionize this industry in so many different ways. What we did two years ago no longer works today. And do we, are, are we, do we have that self-awareness? And what are we doing to be able to improve that experience for children, but also to our work? What else? Anything else? I can tell you for us in Hillsborough County, every single day, well, we've done some remarkable things in the last three years, and I'm sure that y'all have read about it in the Tampa Bay Times. They love to be able to, uh, you know, continuously show, case everything that we do, good or bad, or even whatever it may be, but when you're leading the seventh largest school district in the nation, you know, we have an opportunity to really set trends. And coming in three years ago, we've had, we were faced with a $150 million deficit. We were faced with transition starting with COVID. We had to cut 1,500 jobs to be able to pay our 25,000 employees. And on top of that, we had the most under, persistently underperforming schools within the, within the state. 39 persistently underperforming schools and 28 DNF schools, the most in the state of Florida. After hard work, concentration, uh, adopting new systems, new processes, we have, I'm proud to sit in here in front of you today to say the 28 historical DNFs are now down to five. And that we look at 39 persistently low-performing schools, we now are at a point where we only have 18. And we, are, we continue to lead the, the state in the last two years with career technical education being the first not only to have our students engage in CTE courses, but those passing as well. So all this to say is that you're only as good as your next hire. In the last three years, we've doubled down to make certain we hire first round draft picks to create the best educational space and innovative space for every one of our learners in Hillsborough County. However, we are, we are really trying to win the talent war every single day. And I know that each of you, whether you're a corporation, business, and education, it's difficult to do. So how do you do that in, in, in an effort to be able to recruit to a location which has been deemed the number one place to move in uh, the United States as Tampa continues to thrive and grow? And with that comes, with that uh, label and highlight, it comes a major inflation related to the housing market within this community. We saw that the inflation around the nation is around 6.8%, but what we realize in Tampa is at 8.9%, and we are struggling openly to be able to bring individuals, especially in education, to our classrooms just because of the overall affordability of what we have uh, within our communities. We see that in the Hillsborough region that all of our educators that we're recruiting are living on the outskirts of the city and the county due to the fact of the affordability. The issue is, is that we start playing with danger because we're surrounded by so many different counties that have more sophisticated, more funding related to be able to pay the market. So now for us, we have to figure out how to put the shoulder to the wheel and know that we can't do this in an isolated, um, in an isolated manner and that we have to be able to engage marketing initiatives to be and also link with every one of our civic leaders, our delegations, our cities and our, uh, and our councilmen to, and our commissioners to find out what we can do, especially with our developers, to offer our employees something that's more attractive than surrounding counties. When you're serving 250 schools and you have 25,000 employees and 14,000 of those are teachers, you can't sit on the sidelines and say, you know what, they'll come to us they need a job. Jobs are everywhere. In the last three years, 
we've learned that, you know what, for the majority of our, our, our community members, stakeholders across this nation, that individuals can, can work from home. They can dress from the waist up, sit behind that computer, make much money, make a, make a lot of money, potentially more money, versus transition into one of the most rewarding professions that we have, which is education. So for us, if we copy and paste everything that we've done in the last couple of years, we will lose that talent war every single day. It's for us, we're in the, we're in the process of, of changing the majority of boundaries in Hillsborough County. We have 250 schools. My recommendation to the board right now is to change over 100 boundaries in the school district and fully repurpose around uh, 10 schools within our school district, which is repurposing or potentially closing. And in that plan is selling two of the facilities to find a developer to create affordable housing for our employees. That is, when we talk about being able to create offerings that may be systemic or may be able to have incentives, these are the ways that we have to think differently and innovative in an effort to keep and to recruit our talent every single day in that process. So for us, when we talk about innovation, it's not only innovation about how we market, but it's how we incentivize and retain individuals within our, within our workforce. And knowing that the, the, you know, from our perspective that every one of these facilities can't be fully um, you know, affordable housing for our employees, but a large percentage in our RFP will be able to mainstream and push that where we can create spaces for our learners. When we talk about, yes ma'am, go ahead. Oh, oh, oh sorry. We, no, sorry, I know. I don't, I, yeah, so I, my, my other question that I really want to hope or hope you can address is the social emotional shift. Yeah. We're hearing a lot of school districts say they've got enormous discipline issues. They've got enormous yeah. loss of social gain, right, so because sure. of the pandemic, and they're just, they're facing down a population of students that are almost feral. Right. So in the last three years, when we, and, and I compare everything to pre-pandemic, to where from 2019 was the baseline to where we are today. We do see an uptick in uh, the number of students that are exhibiting undesired behaviors. We see that, and that is because of a number of reasons. A, you got to remember that 18, for 18 months in, in Hillsborough County, we had thousands upon thousands of students that did not come to school. They stayed at home. And whether it be virtual learning, simultaneous learning, they didn't come. So all the norms, all the practices, all the proactive solutions, all the positive behavior intervention supports that we implemented, all of that had to be relearned and retaught for our students. We had to double down on what we do related to emotional development. And the, and the emotional development wasn't only about through our working about how we would revisit our code of student conduct and create more opportunities for restorative practices and strengthen language, but we had to create mindset initiatives and embed curriculum such as second step in the elementary side, such as seven mindsets in the secondary side to retrain learners about how they interact every single day, how they interact with text, how they interact with adults, how they interact with, with peers, how they de-escalate situations versus be giving their emotional energy to non-issues that they sensationalize, and how we are consistent from one classroom to the next. Consistencies with systems and processes are everything. We have to be able to make certain we're in classrooms, we focus on positives, you know, positives for students to be able to interact with their techs, how to be a table coach, how to be mentors, how to be peer, setting up peer advisory groups. All those had to be established during this particular time. And we see it, the, you know, we serve, the majority of students that we serve in Hillsborough County are black and brown. We, so we saw an uptick in referrals and uh, with all of our students, but also we put in restorative practice in student advisory boards and peer auditing boards, where students not only were interacting with adults about you know, why they made their decisions, how they could think about differently, this is just the consequence, because we're so good at, this is the, the code of student conduct, this is the progression, progression and discipline that you're going to extend. And you know what, here's your consequent, have a nice day. If we don't break that cycle of behavior through having true conversations and reflection pieces, we'll have a copy and paste of mentalities every day within our, within our schools. So putting student advisory boards and peer conversations in front, of our, in front of those who made bad decisions and creating that accountability has led us to be, to success, led us to success. But we also had to, in every one of our 
hardcore classrooms, take five minutes to seven minutes a day to really talk about how mindsets should be developed how they interact every single day, how they take uh, proactive steps to create their best space and, be, and, and their, be, you know, their best self, what they do to have that, um, that interaction to, to make sure that they're communicating, collaborating, and staying away from the emotional energy from social media and truly having conversations to what matter from the learning perspective. And on top of that, we put climate and culture uh, leads in every one of our high schools, meaning that we had someone on campus that we trained to be able to go in and to penetrate the classrooms in big, large, common areas to gain access to students, to build thriving relationships, to allow them to be able to address any one of our students that may have issues. And then we had to double down and leverage mental health dollars and put, and put clinical con uh, therapeutic clinicians in a drop-in clinics in over 100, uh, over 100 of our schools. That means that if Addison had a bad day on the bus, and we know that Addison probably, whoo, he needs a, a bunch of fun days. If he had a bad day on the bus, he can walk into a, uh, you know, a, a drop-in clinic with a clinician for five minutes and just let it out, release it. If they had a bad experience at home, a bad experience at work, a bad experience in one classroom, that's in over 100 of our schools. And on top of that, we had to be able to double down and we just launched Hazel to have not only mental health telehealth for our students to be able to alleviate some of the time for our school counselors, but also addresses the physical health side as well, where students can, with, with consent from parents, they can get physical health and get prescriptions, uh, you know, identified through a doctor and be able to see that clinician on site as well. We've had to double down related to this process. Everyone can look at numbers and see that numbers have been escalated across this nation, but it's about how we do it, what we train. That training is through youth mental health first aid, trauma-informed training, and continue to, to make certain that we have real-time coaching when we, when we visit classrooms. We have a suite of 30 to 40 mentor teachers that transition from school to school to school, and we, we have an equity index indicator of how we serve and support schools within, within our school district about how much support they receive on a monthly, bi-weekly, weekly, or daily basis. And we rank that by so many different indicators by being, uh, you, know, you know, experienced, by being uh, proficient, um, by looking at different analytics to be able to determine how we penetrate our classrooms to be able to have real-time coaching. And I'm talking about real-time coaching when, when, you know, if if I'm coaching and I'm teaching core concepts about polynomials and we see that there's a separation with students having that aha moment, someone in that classroom controlling, stopping the lesson, engaging with students, asking high-level questions, making certain they're referring to text, and that's only done through academics, but it's also done through behavior or making certain that we have that proximity and that connection and being able to pull and push in with students to have that success. Yes, ma'am. Sorry. I'm That's a all right. question person today. It's all right. Um, all right, so we're, we're tracking also that Europe has put, uh, and other, other areas of the world have put coding in as core. Yep. And uh, I don't know what you're doing, but, but can you address that a little bit? Because this is really a big deal in the United States. People are treating it like just the CTE thing. Yeah. They're not putting it in all subjects? You know what, if, if, we, if we continue to sit on the sidelines with coding, we will lose the preparation and the workforce, you know, for down the road. And we, we see, you know, across this globe, it's become a standalone priority and embedded in toward the core competencies. For us, what we're trying to do is make sure we have the greatest exposure right now, and that's through making certain that robotics and coding is exposed to elementary school students, middle school students, and then we do have pathways for high school students as well. But it's about exposure and access, and it has to be uh, to the forefront with, with our students. For us, we do hours of code. We, uh, we have before, during, and after school processing with coding. But it has to be embedded into project-based learning. Project-based learning is where it will be, where every one of the core competency classes, core classes are, are taking on project interaction and having conversations and knowing what the English language arts classes is doing through the science class, to what's going on for the mathematical conceptual, uh, conceptual understanding and mathematical practices, to what's going on through the ELA. All those 
project-based learning processes have to be able to uh, in, involve and engage STEM or STEAM, whichever, whatever you want to call it. It has to be in the forefront or we will lose the preparation of our students not having sophisticated jobs as they transition to go to the workforce. For us in Hillsborough County, we have 60% or 65% of our student body, they transition to the workforce. So when we talk about creating full option graduates for those who are ready to go to the workforce, post-secondary education or military, we have got to be primed and ready to be able to have that, that needle threaded to be embedded. This also, you can't do it in isolation. You have got to have business partners and corporations that adopt wings, adopt classrooms, adopt schools, help you draft curriculum through your advisory boards in order for this to be able to be sensationalized throughout your school district. But I think that, you know, for us, eventually, we're, we, we have, we're behind. We have got to get to a point where we just don't lean on the big four, but we start looking at the incorporation of, of, of coding, technology, STEM activities that are embedded. Because what we're trying to, what, what corporations and companies want to see, not only they want to have the soft skills of learners, but they want them to be able to problem solve, decision make, be analytical, synthesize content and materials in, 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 in an effort to show and, and to make right decisions that will help their, uh, their uh, corporations and companies thrive through innovative practices. And you can't do that without those types of uh, characteristics penetrating every one of our, our core competencies within our school district. Yes, ma'am. I am the question girl. It's all right. It's great. Yeah. So, so it helps me. So Learning Council is really tracking that we're undergoing something that a lot of districts can't even name. Like, what is happening with this convergence of all these things at the same time? And the, the hypothesis is that we're moving to more of a network mode net mentality. Parents and students now want real flexibility. Sure. They want 100% individualized path. And the way that we're modeled is a manufacturing. Model. We are, we are. And you're already, you already talked about a mutation to consolidate buildings. How are you feeling about becoming more of like a node on a global network, providing some sort of branded Hillsborough-ness, sure. right? So, uh, so this is like the mutation. Yep. This is huge, and nobody's really put their finger on it. Right. So if, and I talked about copy and paste. If, if we do what we've done always in 2019, copy and paste master schedules, copy and paste budgets, copy and paste extracurricular activities, copy and paste our professional developments because there are criteria in that process, then we're gonna lose every single day. We see more kids than ever that parents want not only the flexibility, they want that unique perspective or that pathway that's, that's going to champion and follow their individual student's heart. So if we continue to stand up, and, and, and I push everyone, and, and education, and we're doing this now, we have to, we have to be self-aware of where this workforce is going. We have to be self-aware of ed where education is going. And it's going exactly where we, we want to be. Able to, it, it'll become whatever we want it to become. But, but right now, being stiff and being still, we're losing kids every single day. So if we don't be, if, we don't, if we're not fast adopters in this process of rebuilding our master schedules, looking at every one of our career technical educational pathways, looking at every one of our configurational offerings, then we're going to lose kids not only to private institutions, which we see it, to charter institutions, to home to homeschooling events but we but we have got to redefine who we are this is the perfect time never waste a great a, 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 you know a crisis you know, COVID gave us an opportunity to rethink the way that we offer educational offerings. And we look at, home, you know, virtual K-12. We have our leader here today. You know, we, we talked about many spaces of having satellite coffee shops, Starbucks locations throughout the geographical location in Tampa where virtual learners can stop in and stop out and put some of our certified educators in there where they can feel that that's a comfortable space. Not every one of our learners needs or are at an accelerated pass to go to a comprehensive of traditional school. They want options and opportunities. They may want blended models, a virtual half of the day, standalone classes the other half of the day. And if we don't say that's okay, 
then we will lose we, we will lose students as they journey out and they move to different locations. And we talk about all the attractors that we have. And every one of our schools, we're doing an audit of every attractor. And some of these attractors have been here for 15 years and 20 years. And some of them are just a name and they're not in practice and they're not supported by uh, financial budgeting. So this is the space right now to selectively abandon attractors, to be able to redefine attractors and really double down and really get a survey to our community. And what are you looking for? What educational pathway do you need? What excites you? What creates interest? You know, the, the traditional K through five schools, that's no longer a, st a staple within, that I see in education. Parents want more K through eights to have that stability. They are not afraid to have a K through six or to be able to transition to a seventh and eighth grade. Uh, you know, back that's old traditional going back to that because they need psychological safety. We do a really good job in public education of recruiting kids in elementary. We do a really good job of getting kids back in high school, but we've got to figure out how to get middle years right. Middle years, of, this is where kids socially, emotionally, um, you know, intellectually start to experiment in so many different ways. So how do we create that innovative space for them where there's comfortability um, in that particular time? So now, whether it be artificial intelligence, whether it be logistics, manufacturing, augmentation, we have got to be able to stand and do something different. Why should we not have you know, Tesla involved in our workspace to being able to call, create solar energy for vehicles and, and other elements within our schools? That longer, stronger bench has to exist. We have to know our community, bang on the door of the corporations, bring them to our schools, and let's sell hope every day for our kids. And if we don't, we'll lose them. Love it. Questions, people. <laughs> I can't be the only one asking questions. You can come hang out with me and we got a you know press conference here in about 20 minutes. That would be a fun one. I'm sure I get a lot of questions there. <laughs> yes, sir. It would be nice, kind of. I know, right? It would be fun. We're used to those, right? Yeah. Yes, sir. What would you say are the like, top three hot challenges that you have? I just want to know, like, what side, what's keeping you up at? Yeah, so, I mean, right now, boundaries, number one, but that's short term, right? That's short term. It, boundaries helps us to be able to get kids. And we have uh, 23 schools that are very overutilized, which is 110% or more capacity, and, and underutilized, very underutilized, which is 60% under. So, you know, from a fiscal responsibility perspective to make certain that we have high qualified skilled teachers in, in front of children every single day we that's one thing that we have to do and it helps us from a fiscal responsible perspective as well as we save millions of dollars by doing that that's the first one the second one is for uh, for us is is oh i said earlier is trying to win the talent war I mean, we, we, are, we have over 400 educational instructional vacancies within our school district. And when you have 14,000 teachers, I mean, you do the math, 20, 000, you know, 20 kids per classroom, that's thousands of kids that we're trying to be innovative in our space. We are leaning on highly qualified, high impact yield, you know, high impact teachers to come into large spaces such as this in their schools who are willing in taking a, uh, you know, another teacher and then co-teaching in the big spaces and leaning on the experts in content knowledge. So whether that be a, a space that, uh, that we're in here today, it could be a, if you're departmentalized for math or, or, or science, being able to have that co-teach space where everyone is in the same room and then we're working out and having interventionists for small group instruction. But for us right now, we're, we're trying, I mean, I've got kids and I'm not trying to be funny in, in some of our schools, we're in, we're in cafeterias to make certain that they are getting the tier one core instruction, which is so important to get. I can even get the tier two and tier three with small group intervention to work on uh, skills or acceleration opportunities because we're embedding that into our core competencies and, and, and hijacking some of our uh, curriculum guides so the annual standards are exposed by a skilled teacher versus having substitutes. So the talent war keeps me up at night every single day. Every child deserves a highly qualified, skilled leader, a teacher within, within, their, um, within their class. The third thing that, that keeps me up at night is our ability to become and offer different, you know, different solutions. We, we have got to be able to create innovative spaces within our schools. And we have got to be able to push our, our legislators, 
to be able to help fund us with, with pilot models. We've got to be able to push our legislators for additional funding that's, uh, that has the flexibility to create innovative spaces. And we've got to be able to think differently from a cabinet regional perspective and a principal level and a board's level of what we can offer differently with it within our schools. I mentioned some other things. You know, for, for us, we want to be able to look at some of our schools that create um, early learning centers. We need to be able to have three-year-old, four-year-old programs at our schools along the way. And, and as you know, we don't have the money, a $150 million deficit a couple years ago that we had to address. So being able to leverage pr uh, public-private partnerships are major. So why, if we can't afford to stand up, to, you know, three and four-year-old programs, going to the private providers and educating them about bringing them to our space so we can have a farm system of getting kids exposed to content curriculum to our school base and allowing them to have that um, continued seamless transition from three-year-old, four-year-old, all the way to, to, to fifth grade. So, you know, for us, it's about, um, you know, for me, I love to take risk. There's a lot of uh, you know rewards in it, and there's a you know you win some, you lose some, but uh, for, for you know right now in Hillsborough County, this is the time. This is the time in the space to be as in, as innovative as you can to have the greatest vision of what we want education to become, and and get into a room of the greatest problem solvers, and let's allow, allow them to be in part of a community of practice. What I'd say to each of you, you can't do this in isolation. You know, as, as, as smart, you know, I, I agree, hard work and brains get you, uh, you know, will get you far, but, but not having the lens of exposure to different historical perspectives and different learners and different um, thinkers will be able to put you in a place that, will, that you'll struggle. Let's give a big round of applause. Uh.